many patients are you testing on? So we, uh, the plan for the trial is to test in uh, close to 400 patients. That's going to be the total amount of patients we're going to enroll in a trial. The trial is going to involve about 50 sites uh, globally, so we're going to have uh, hospitals in the U.S. and outside the U.S. Uh, also participate in the trial. The trial has a what's what's called a randomized controlled design uh, and adaptive design as well. So the idea here is that uh, in order to understand if this new medication uh, works and is efficacious to improve uh, the you know the the disease process, will uh, will have w half of the group is going to have the medication, the other half is going to receive the placebo medication. The placebo basically is, is the same look in infusion. It's an infusion of about 30 minutes a day, uh, but without the active drug. So everyone's going to receive all of the supportive care that's needed for to treat the infection, uh, but half is going to receive the new medication and half is going to receive the placebo. So the idea here is that by the end of the study, we can understand if if there is any effect, any positive effect from the new medication compared to the patients that uh, receive this standard of care. What's your most optimistic timeline for knowing if it works or not? Uh, you know the. Uh, the advantage of this design, it's called an adaptive design, is that there is, again, it, there is an adaptation to the process compared to, let's say, what people did in the last five, ten years. Uh, this new design is we can, you know, we can keep looking into the data and, and see if the drug is working or not uh, relatively fast. So I think the trial is going to be uh, run very efficiently and fast. but. The time that's going to take, it's hard to know because it's going to depend on how this uh, whole outbreak um, uh, evolves. I mean, you know, we, we don't know exactly. I mean, the, the expectance from the CDC uh, uh, today and from WHO is that uh, there is a uh, uh, expectance that this outbreak is still ongoing and maybe get worse. And so it depends on how, you know, how the infection spreads out, uh, the, the try can be done really fast or really slow. You know, it's going to depend on how the whole situation evolves. Would you think it within a year? I would, I would think that, uh, you know, with, you know, looking for 400 patients, the way that things are at this point, yes, uh, we should have the results either in a year or maybe even less, at least the preliminary results. I know you've used this in the past, mm -hmm. Ebola, some other, so what, what types of changes did you see when you thought you, it was successfully working? So, uh, so this medication has uh, an activity uh, stopping the replication of certain viruses, and as you mentioned, well, the uh, one of the viruses was the Ebola virus, and the other virus that we know that the medication also has the ability to stop the DNA replication is with the coronavirus, and this uh, this medication has been tested. Uh, in the other coronaviruses that we had in the past, and it seems to have a definitely a solid in vitro activity, and also studies in animals have shown activity of the medication. But we we don't know if the medication will have the same effect in human beings, and that's why we we need to uh, test in this randomized trial. What did you did you learn if it was more effective by getting it to the person at a certain point of the virus? Good question. So we, the trial requires that the patient uh, has uh, the diagnosis of the infection. So we're going to make the diagnosis of the infection by uh, using special, you know, tests to diagnose. But we want to, we want to, you know, we want to try to enroll these patients as early as possible. As as with most of the viral diseases, uh, the earlier you start the medication, uh, the more efficacious is going to be if the medication has activity against the virus. So it, specifically in this clinical trial, uh, we want uh, the patients to be enrolled within 72 hours of the, uh, the diagnosis of the infection. So we want to really catch these patients nice and early uh, to give them the best chance to have the, uh, the positive effects of any treatment. Are these patients all within the United States only? So the trial will be international trial. So we, we start here in Nebraska, but the idea is to um, uh, to have sites both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. So uh, we're looking at several countries uh, in which you're going to participate as well in this NIH-sponsored trial. Have you decided which ones? Will some of the Chinese, I know some have already tried. So right, there, there are some trials. There are some trials already uh, being done in China. Uh, we. 
the goal from the NIH, I, I'm, I cannot speak for NIH, but my understanding is the goal is to to have several other countries that already have, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the infection, uh, uh, you know, diagnosed. So there, there's infection in, in, in South Korea and in Japan and Singapore and Iran. So there are several other countries that already have, you know, now in Italy. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we're going to go out, you know, outside and try to uh, in get as many sites as we can to be participating in this trial. I think this is going to be very important because that not only um, improves the speed of the process, but also gives the opportunity to other countries to participate in the trial as well. How did the team determine which of these was going to be the first participant? Was that, you know, a, a, the team's decision or was that the patient's decision? So, so the uh, you know the the team the the uh, the team is really going out and 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 trying to uh, get as you know as many centers that uh, are willing to participate to be uh, to be you know you know evaluate you know we're going to have all, you know, so the, the, as 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 you can imagine to participate in a trial have to have a uh, uh, you know a specific infrastructure that is required by the trial uh, so the way that that. This happens is that the the NIH team will uh, you know will go you know in different places in different sites and evaluate to see if the those hospitals and sites are uh, you know will fit the uh, the requirements of the trial and in that case then uh, and the procedure you know will move forward uh, but this is going to be a you know a evaluation in case by case uh, and this is really important because it, you want to have a homogeneous a number of sites that can provide the same requirements in order for you to know if this new medication works or not. Will the individuals who are being treated with the disease, will, they, will these people have already been quarantined for going through that whole process? So some of these patients uh, will potentially be in a quarantine and if they, so in order to be in a trial they have to, to be a little sicker than just a mild disease, so let's say a mild disease is somebody that has a runny nose, a little bit of congestion, headache, uh, maybe a little cough, uh, and you know would be more like the the old uh, common cold that we would call. Uh, these patients will not be enrolled in the trial. In order to be in the trial, they have to have a, a, you know a little more uh, severe disease, uh, in which we define as a viral pneumonia. So they have to have the virus already likely in the lungs, not only, you know, in, in, in the upper part of the respiratory tract. So these patients will have a, to be enrolled in a trial, they would have to have the coronavirus test positive, and they're going to have to have signs of lung infection that it's like signs of pneumonia. So uh, these patients, in this case, answering to your question, they would not be in, in a quarantine because they will need to be hospitalized. So. In order to uh, participate in the trial, these patients will have to have pneumonia, and they're going to have to be hospitalized as well. And, and how long will they be hospitalized? For? So the that is going to be really dependent on uh, their progression. So if the patient is able to improve relatively fast, either because the patient has, uh, you know, it's clearing the infection fast, or because the medication of the trial is working. Uh, the uh, the patients are going to stay in a hospital as long as they need. Uh, you know, if 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 there's indication that they're improving fast, they can leave the hospital. They're going to leave the hospital. If there's indication that they need a little longer, they will stay longer. But the trial will not um, the trial will not define how long these patients are going to need. So we're going to give the this new medication for up to ten days. That that's the way that the trial is defined. But if the patient improves faster than that, can leave the hospital early. If the patient needs longer, the patient is going to stay longer. But that's, that's going to be the, the allocation of the treatment is going to be for a full 10 days, uh, one injection every day. Why the distinction for giving it only to someone with pneumonia-like symptoms? Is it because they're the ones that are most likely to be fatal? Correct. So the, uh, uh, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the patients will have a very mild disease uh, and, uh, you know, they will clear the infection by themselves. Like most of us when they have a common cold, uh, so would not, uh, not, would not be advisable to give a intravenous medication uh, for somebody that will likely clear the infection uh, quite fast. Uh, so the uh, the goal here is really trying to uh, uh, help the people that we need the most. These are the people that will potentially have a more severe disease, uh, more sequelae, and potentially even be a life-threatening situation. These are the patients that are going to require a uh, a more aggressive treatment. That's that's the goal of the trial. Yes. Will there be a breaking point at which you say before you get to 400? <coughs> at which you say 
hey, this really is working. All you folks who get sick from now on should get this. Good question. Stop the trial early and say everybody gets who's really sick gets it. Very good question. So the uh, the adaptive design means that we're going to be evaluating very frequently uh, if the medications work or not. So if if we turn out, let's say that. Uh, uh, you know, much earlier than the 400, when the first 100, 200 patients, uh, there is strong indication that this medication works. Uh, then uh, we'll, uh, you know, this medication is going to become part of the control group, and we're going to bring a new medication. So there is this, all of these adaptations. So the trial has, you know, has uh, a design that we can bring new therapies. Let's say uh, we want to test a new medication that is, uh, you know, was just found to be effective against coronavirus. So we can bring the new medication, and all the new medication is going to be the treatment arm, and, and this medication that works is going to be moved to the control arm. So, and if this medication works, this medication can be moved to the control arm, and we can test a new medication. So we can test a third, a fourth, a fifth, whatever. So there's basically almost unlimited amount of treatment can be, uh, you know, can be tested in this type of adaptive design because we can always, we're always looking into you know, let's say if the medication does not work, is not is being futile, is not doing anything for patients, then we can remove this medication immediately uh, and bring a new medication to be tested in the same trial. So instead of you know starting the trial, finishing a trial, starting a trial, finishing a trial, we keep the trial running and we keep just adding and removing drugs according to working or not working. So it is a very dynamic process. Why is it so important to make this a double blind uh, study doctor? Very important and good question. Uh, you know, um, human beings are, you know, tend to be always, um, uh, you know, uh, anxious to know what's happening and it's part of our, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, the way that we are. And, and so once we, we start to making guesses if the patient is receiving a medication, if the patient is not receiving, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, both the patients and the doctors and the healthcare professionals can uh, uh, adjust they are, you know, the way the things are being done according to, you know, what they know if the patient's receiving or not the medication. So uh, in order to avoid all types of biases in these studies, that's why double blind is so important and randomization is so important because uh, when we give this, uh, this therapy to, uh, uh, to the patients in a trial, uh, the doctors are not going to know, the nurses are not going to know, the patients are not going to know, uh, so we, nobody's going to know exactly what, uh, you know, what medication the patient is receiving, if it's the placebo or the medication or the active medication. This is really important because in that way there is no bias that's going to be affecting the results of the studies. When the studies finish and, and we have the results analyzed, we're going to know for sure if the medication works or not. Once we don't double blind, uh, the study becomes much more um, a, a, a potentially affected by the biases of both the healthcare professionals and the patients as well. So we try to avoid this process of biasing uh, by doing the double blind process. Yes. You said when you did the study with ZMAP after you reported the results from the New England Journal of Medicine mm -hmm. that uh, even though that study had to end because there weren't enough patients going forward in Mm -hmm. Have you found that to be true, or things you've learned during those studies carrying on into this one? Uh, good question. So the, the ZMAP trial was one of the uh, trials that uh, we participated as well uh, with the NIH uh, on the, in the 2014th Ebola outbreak. And um, the, uh, the, trial, uh, the, the trial was started towards the end of the outbreak, and the trial had to be finished um, earlier than expected because the outbreak, uh, you know, finished as well. Uh, and so even though the trial was not fully completed, uh, the, the ZMAP trial, the design of that trial was very important because it, it, it gave us the tools to understand that actually you can do that type of adaptive design uh, in the middle of an outbreak. And, and so the, that trial, that the, the name of the trial is called PREVAIL trial, uh, actually was essential uh, for the next trial that was just completed um, you know, a few months ago in Africa, the PALM trial that also was sponsored by the NIH. That now brought two new drugs uh, to, be, to be found to be effective against the Ebola virus. Uh, and so in this trial that we're now uh, doing for uh, against the coronavirus is actually has the design very similar to the Prevail and the Palm trial. So we are learning 
you know, it's a learning curve from these trials, but no questions that uh, what was done in 2014 uh, is, is helping us to understand how to do things better during this outbreak. So it's, this is actually, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, in the United States, this is probably the rapid, uh, you know, the, the most rapid uh, kind of trial initiation that uh, we've seen in, you know, in, in our American history because the trial is list, I mean, was just designed a few weeks ago in the NIH and we're able to bring the trial here and, uh, and get started right, uh, right away. So a matter of we're talking about weeks. Normally this, these trials have, it, they're so complex, they involve so many layers of approval, uh, both administrative, ethical, uh, in hospital and patient that, uh, it, you know, normally takes months, months and months for these trials to be up and running. And now we're talking about weeks. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is a record, I would say, and, and it's very important because this is the way that we have to, to do during outbreaks. We don't, we don't have the leisure of time. We have to start early. We have to really get these uh, drugs being tested early. And, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, to me, it's a great lesson that this can be done and is being done at this point. Mm -hmm. to branch out internationally, mm -hmm. is that correct? Exactly, exactly right. So both nationally and internationally. And then one, one, go ahead, go ahead. one person's on it now here. Correct, correct. We have one person enrolled in the trial at this point, and this is the first patient enrolled in the trial. Has that person started to receive the drug then? The, the, so the, if the patient is enrolled, yes. Yeah, that's all I can tell. I cannot tell anything about the patient, but yeah, if the patient enrolled, the patient has, is the right receiving the drug, correct. And what you mean by that? You are absolutely correct. Somebody's got He's it. just receiving an injection. He's receiving an injection every day, uh, and it could be either the, uh, the active drug or could be the placebo. Is it, walk me through that. Is it just like getting meds in your line, or how is this one different? It's like getting meds in your, yeah, so, you know, the, you know, patients will require different medications through an IV line, uh, and this is just getting medications through an IV line, exactly. It's like any other medication. And, and, you know, you, by, by looking by the infusion, you don't know, you, you have no idea what it is. It's just another, another infusion, not a, you know, like a little bag with a medication that goes directly in the vein. Anything else? And you said that uh, this drug has been successful with other strains of coronavirus? Correct. So what we know is that the drug has been successful both in vitro and in animal uh, models, but we don't know if this drug is going to be successful in humans, and that's why we need to do this trial. And that was with what, MERS and? MERS and, and SARS, yeah. So there was activity against both the SARS and MERS, you know, different types of coronavirus. And those were only in animals, you said? Those all, you know, in, in vitro and, you know, in vitro and, and animal studies, yes. Thank you.